My name is John Thurber. I'm vice chair of the board and vice president for public affairs at Thomas Edison State College, and it's my great privilege to welcome you to this luncheon. We're fortunate to have Scott Morgan with us today to tell us how to establish immediate rapport. And now it's my job to introduce Peter Crowley, our CEO and president. I'd like to bring up Grant Somerville. Grant is part of the program committee, and Grant will introduce our speaker today. Grant? In his most recent piece, Scott talks about a recurring nightmare. He writes, Maybe I'm the only one who wonders what life would have been like if I was cooler, smarter, hipper, or stronger. He also says, maybe I'm the only one that fears that one small mistake, one small misstep, one innocuous shortcoming will spell the death of my business and my client's business. For our today's speaker, it started at age seven. He wrote his first mystery short story. He told his parents and his teachers that he wanted to write like Agatha Christie. His first novel was written while he was in high school. Scott is a teacher, speaker, journalist, and best-selling author. His book, Character De Development from the Inside Out, is a nonfiction guide for fiction writers. Please join me in a very warm Princeton Chamber welcome to Scott Morgan. The thing you learn in journalism that um, first impressions and immediate rapport are key to building good relationships. Now, in science, they teach you that um, first impressions are made within one tenth of a second, which is really scary if you stop and think about it. I mean, the idea that you sort of go, and you're already done. It's like, I know you, I know, no. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily buy that, but I found that in journalism itself, and I found this actually translates into business, I learned that you have about five seconds before people tune you out. It was six weeks into being a reporter, 9-11 happened. And I know everybody's got a 9-11 story, and I, I don't want to take up too much time, but the very first person I walked up to and asked, you know, tell me the story, told me, get out of my face. And the guy was really huge. And his wife is bigger than me, which is not really that much of a stretch because I'm kind of a <laughs> tiny guy. But, you know, still, it was just, it was really, really awkward. And I walked up to the next group of guys thinking, I can't do this. I don't know how to, to do this. I walked up to these guys and I was sort of, uh, can I ask you a question? Or, and these guys fortunately just kind of talked and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But I really, I lost this first guy within five seconds because I came off like, you know, an idiot who just kind of, you know, wanted a story as opposed to somebody who really wanted to find out something human and humanistic about the whole, you know, episode that eventually turned out to be 9-11. In life, I find out that these first impressions that we make are malleable. I don't know how many people can see it from here, but yes, the bald head, the tattoo, you know, I, I kind of scare people sometimes. And I don't mean to, and I'm not really that scary a guy. I'm a vegan. How scary can I possibly be? I had a friend, uh, Peter, from Australia who was kind of funny looking. And yet every place we went, women were like to this guy. I mean, they were just always all over this dude. And I finally asked my wife, my girlfriend at the time, I said, so, okay, you tell me. It's like, is this guy just like awesome or something? Is he like really great looking? I mean, what is it? Why are women all over this dude all the time? And she said, I said, is he better looking than me? And she said, of course not. Well, she has to say that, but you know. But objectively, I did ask people later, am I better looking than Peter? And everybody went, yeah, actually, you are objectively. And I thought, thank you. You're all stupid, but thank you, you know. But OK. So I said, well, then what was it about Peter if it wasn't his looks? And she said, well, he looks dangerous. I was like, well, that's interesting. It's the same thing you told me, you know. And she says to me, this is the girl I married. And she says to me, you're not a good dangerous. I said, what do you mean I'm not a good dangerous? And she said, well, Pete has the kind of, you know, motorcycle jacket, like, let's go do something we'll regret later, put it on Cinemax kind of bad guy thing, you know. And I had the, let's go into the alleyway, let me introduce you to my tire iron kind of bad thing. And I was like, again, vegetarian, how bad could I possibly be? So, and this is the girl I ended up marrying. So observation is really where it starts. And just paying attention to how people are, how they're acting, how they're interacting. You know, again, if I were at a children's party and I showed up in a clown suit, that's fine. If I go to the bank in one, that's not good. You know, if I drive a Mary Kay car because I sell Mary Kay, that's great. If I'm driving away from the bank at high speed with a bag with a dollar sign on it, that's not good. As far as practical steps go, the very first thing to do, for those of you over there who can't see, smile. It actually helps quite a bit. 
to smile. And when I say smile, I mean genuinely smile. Because I got to tell you, when I was in high school, my and I went to a Catholic high school, pity accepted. Um, <laughs> I um, I had a principal who we called Skeletor, because she was scary like Skeletor. But anyway, we called her Skeletor, and she was scary as hell. She really scared us to death. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that when she walked around and smiled, if you say, good morning, sister, and you smiled, and hey, how you doing, or whatever, she would kind of look like this. <laughs> now, I mean, anybody ever had that psychology class where they have like the Margaret Thatcher, and it's like there's a picture of Margaret Thatcher's head smiling, and then the other one's upside down, and it looks like she's smiling, you know? <laughs> But then you turn it over and it's like this rictus of, you know, horror or something. This was my principal in high school. And this smile scared us to death, which I think was probably her goal. I recommend that when you try to actually get to know new people, don't at them. Because people tend to react badly to that. So they don't really want to be sneered at like you're about to eat their heads. So, um, but smile, you know, it's, it's a very easy first step to take. And it belies something else, which is to be authentic. You have to be authentic. I, you know, I don't really try to hide it. I don't try to hide the tattoo or the bald head. You know, although I'm not really bald, I just left my hair home. So, sorry, that was sorry, that was bad. Um, I shouldn't have said that because my next thing about it is after a smile. The one of the thing, one of the ways to really establish good rapport with people, is a sense of humor. Is to actually have a sense of humor. Mel Brooks, uh, talking one time, about how he. Um, he often had made movies or shows or something. They, they had Nazis that were funny or whatever. Well, you know, Mel Brooks was actually Melvin Kaminsky. He's a little Jewish boy from the Upper East Side, and most of his family was decimated by these very people he made fun of. And somebody asked him one time in an uh, interview, a 2020 or some kind of thing, and said, well, why, how could you do that? How could you make fun of these Guys, this, he was awful. And he said, because if you laugh at somebody like him with his funny mustache and his funny clothes and his funny flag and his funny outfits, you rob him of his dignity. Humor has the power to rob people of their dignity and has the power to elevate people into a whole new relationship. It's amazing. The first thing women say they want when they meet new guys is a sense of humor. Guys don't say that. I know that. But, um, but women like it. That's when I was a reporter. I, I had a certain standard. I mean, you develop shtick after a while. And everybody, I think, knows this. You have a couple of stock things that you might say in a given situation. So uh, I would talk to people on the phone. And if I forgot something, I would say, mm, yeah, you know, hang on one second. It's like I, I you know, my, my brain fails me or something, you know. And uh, I would ask, did you ever see the movie Memento? Now, has anybody here ever seen the movie Memento? You've seen, yeah. Now, this, for anybody who doesn't know, the movie is um, uh, the same guy who did The Dark Knight and made this movie, and his brother wrote it. But it's about a guy who, during a break-in uh, into his house, gets injured and he develops anti-retrograde amnesia, which means he cannot form new memories after about 15 seconds. So he instinctively tattoos things on himself to remind himself of who he is and what to do. And I said, yeah, you know, I saw this movie and I thought, brother, I'm going to have to start tattooing myself because I never remember a thing. I mean, my pockets are always lined with notes and everything. And ha, 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 you know. And it wasn't supposed to be hilarious, but it was at least supposed to be, you know, something that shows I'm paying attention and I'm not just a total moron, you know. And the woman pauses and says, actually, my husband has a form of anti-retrograde amnesia, and I can't be quite so flip about it. Now, I mentioned I'm a vegan. I mention this again because the only time I actually eat any animal product is when I open my mouth and insert my shoe. So, I mean, you know, I was just kind of joking, but it just, it kind of bothered her. And the whole conversation, though we had a pleasant conversation afterwards, was sort of, you know, kind of this slap me on the face, kind of, you know, this sort of hung on my face, this, this ugly feeling of, you know, I just really insulted this woman. The point is, be cautious with your humor and know to use it wisely. I hate to advocate the Walmart approach to anything in life, but take the Walmart approach and be general, be easy, be light, and be funnier than hell, and everybody will love you. <laughs> and listen to people when you're trying to get to know people. Don't just say, hi, I'm Scott, what do you do? I, and then just launch into you know, your, 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 your prepared you know, speech and take you know, an hour and a half out of their time. And only the other person really gets is, I, well, but, and they don't really have any other things to say. Keep your mouth closed and listen to people. It's the same thing as observing people. People will tell you things if you listen to them. Um, I would get a lot of interns who would come in with a list of questions that they would call somebody up. 
And they would say, well, you know, tell me what you're, you know, what's going on? I mean, who are you? And, and the person on the other end would say something like, well, I was a sparring partner for Muhammad Ali, and then I started my own business. And like, yeah, that's great. So where'd you grow up? And it's kind of like, whoa, you know, bring, what happened with Muhammad Ali, man? This is, this is cool, you know? It's like, yeah, well, you know, Muhammad Ali and Richard Nixon used to, I used to, you know, have a, a sparring match with every other day, but oh, it's okay, we'll talk about your, 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 you know, your business or something. It's like, no, get to know this. This is an important thing. So you have to listen, you have to pay attention. Don't go in with just an agenda. Don't go in thinking that you know all the answers. I know there are several attorneys in this room, and the rule of being an attorney is to not ask a question you don't already know the answer to in court. Don't do that in life, you know, especially if any of you somehow become completely insane and want to go into journalism. Uh, don't, don't do that. I mean, don't walk into a situation and think you already know the answer. Uh, the best thing I can tell you is overall, be upfront about your goals and your aims and your expectations of people. But if you want some tips as far as how to frame yourself mentally in order to get to know new people, number one thing is lose your judgment. Do not go in thinking you know people because you don't. I told you, everybody immediately imagines that I was, um, a lot of people actually think I used to belong in a gang. Um, and I've said this, you know, and I, I, I covered a, um, uh, like a town hall meeting in Florence Township once about parents, you know, who had kids, uh, you know, they were trying to, well, parents obviously have kids, but, you know, they, they, were, they were trying to teach them how to, uh, you know, recognize gang symbols and, you know, uh, things like that, or gang language or, or whatnot. And I was sitting way up in the front listening to this guy do this talk. And I thought, I'm going to sit up front because I can't hear in the back because everybody's always, you know, so I sat way up in the front. Well, I started going around afterwards and asking people, well, so tell me, what do you think? And Five parents told me, oh, I was waiting for you to get up and talk. I thought you were an ex-gang member or something. <laughs> I was kind of like, again, you know, it's like how dangerous do I really look to these people? But, you know, apparently I looked like a crip or something. I, I don't know. I was wearing all blue and leaning left and everything was all, you know. So I don't really know what it was. But, you know, these, uh, you know, first impressions sometimes, yes, they're important to make. But don't just rely on the fact that the very first thing you see, I mean, the, they say don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge. Do not go in judging people. Um, there's a great story that um, my friend Eileen is here, and I think Eileen is the one who told me this, um, Eileen Sinet, uh, or at least I heard it at one of your uh, breakfast things, about two um, sort of eh, dressed old people who went in to talk to the president of Harvard and were put on hold out in the hallway, around in the um, foyer or whatever it is in the office, just waiting for to, you know, talk to the president. And the president of Harvard, like, eh, you know, kind of, they're old, they're not well dressed, they're poor, what could they possibly do for me? Eventually, he came out to talk to them, and the old man said, we would like to dedicate a building to our son. And the guy was like, yeah, you know, it's going to take like, you know, $10 million. And the guy's answer was, oh, is that all? We could build a whole college for that. And they went and built Stanford University. But yes, be nice and be polite. You know, they, they do things like offer small compliments to people. You know, notice things about them. You know, just say, I mean, don't in a creepy way. Don't be like, yo, baby, you smell good enough to eat. I mean, don't be like that. You know, I mean, but just say something nice to people. You know, I mean, it, it's, you know, be, be okay around people. Be polite to them, you know. It's, um, it's nice to be polite. Everybody is happier when things are polite. For lack of a better word, be weak. No, the, the idea of, it's not so much that you're being weak, but you are being, you, you're not going in bulldozing. I mean, if I walked in with this microphone and, you know, talk to me, I have something to tell you, blah, 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 you know, rawr, talk to me, you know, or something. You're going to do what the guy did at 9, on 9-12 and told me to get out of your face, you know. It, it, it's not going to really work. When I call people, I don't, I'm with the, I'm with the paper, I'm a reporter, rawr, talk to me, or, you know, because I'm a pirate, you know. I, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't go in like that. I would say, hi, I'm with so-and-so, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I work for this paper. Do you have the time to speak? Can we set up a time to talk? You put it with them because as you've probably heard, it's all about them. That's not really a secret. It is all about them. If you allow people to feel as if they are important when you're talking to them, it's amazing. They will actually feel important. I mean, I, I do a lot of writing and, I, and as Grant mentioned, you know, I teach a fiction writing class and one of the things I teach about character development is and story development is that when you write a story, you don't just tell every single detail. You allow the reader to sort of fill in the blanks. 
Uh, anybody ever remembers Sam Spade and Raymond Chandler? Sam Spade was never really described. It was just described that he was a guy with five o'clock shadow. But everybody saw Sam Spade their own way. You know, when you watch a movie by, say, Quentin Tarantino, there are a lot of unanswered questions that Tarantino has. You know, did, you know, the, the, the tall blonde Amazon at the end of Kill Bill, did she die in that trailer? You know, or some, you don't really know. These are things that you're allowed to fill in. And when people are allowed to sort of become part of the dialogue themselves, they feel as if they're filling in. Allow people to be themselves. Allow people to tell you who they are. It really does help because I got a lot of stories out of a lot of people who otherwise didn't talk to the press. And I did. A lot of people that I know, hung, you know got hung up on, or the stories where, you know, we called, but the guy hung up on me. I mean, you saw that in, you know, uh, competing newspapers, and, um, but not in mine. I, I usually got a story. Hardly anybody ever hung up on me. Don't be desperate, which is another thing. The idea about being desperate, yes, you actually do give off a stink. There is an actual pheromone-based thing, legitimately, that when you're desperate, you know, you, you start getting obnoxious, you start getting clingy, you start getting a little too, you know, in your face. You know, people who text and email you 55 times a day and, you know, it's like, what are you going to wear tonight when we go out? What are you going to order tonight when we go out? It's the same thing that happens in business. And it's very easy to get sidelined by desperation when you are, uh, when business is slow, when, when business goes down. You have to sort of control this idea of being desperate you know you can't come off because as a reporter one of the things you are all the time is at the mercy of everybody else and you have to sort of learn to be the second guy you have to learn to be the more acquiescent person you have to learn to you know sort of look at this situation and nobody's and, and understand that nobody is actually obligated to talk to the press which is a tip for you don't tell the press i said that but you know you're actually under no obligation to talk to the press you can lie to the press all you want you shouldn't because it will bite you on the rear end like that alligator pick you know the postcard with the alligator and it the woman anybody know this you know, with the, she's kind of okay never mind you know, last thing to wrap up i would say that if you're trying to build good immediate rapport with people the one quality that i find that really benefits everybody more than anything else is empathy i found that empathy is the best thing to actually get to know other people because it's not sympathy, it's not pity, it is empathy. You're able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. You're able to see where somebody else is coming from. And if you hang back a minute, if you keep your mouth shut and you listen, if you talk to people, if you're friendly with people, if you do not judge them, you will see that you can empathize with people. You can understand when they're having a bad day. You just don't automatically assume that the guy is a jerk because he barked at you at work on your first day or something. It is perhaps he's having a bad time. You never know what's going on in someone's life, but empathy, please develop your empathy. It is good for you, it is good for your business, it is good for the world. And uh, I should have a better exit strategy than that, but I don't, so I will just say, the end, <laughs> theme, I'm done. So thank you very much for this. Thanks, Scott. I'm gonna call a very interesting young gentleman up um, Ilian Rubin is with the Boy Scouts, and Ilian came to us about two months ago. Uh, his mom's involved the chamber, and he was a young man who last year came in second in Central and South Jersey in selling Boy Scout cook, uh, popcorn. Come on up, hey, come on up. And he said, "I really want to get to be number one." So, if you're a champion for business in the chamber, I said, "This is a great idea." So, this young man has been to two of our events. He went to a breakfast uh, with Eileen. Uh, I guess she had to leave. And he got up and said some stuff. Now, listening to Scott, if you think Scott's scary, imagine being this young man looking at everybody being bigger than you and staring back at you. Uh, you nervous yet? No, oh, no, no, no. Good. it's actually really easy to do. Good. So, Elian's going to help me do two things. One, at, at your table is a sleeve of popcorn that Elian's donated to everybody. The money that, that, that Elian raises does go to the Boy Scouts and teaches about marketing, sales promotion, and basic financial planning. As they set and save goals, as they set goals for themselves, all the money, all the money goes towards scouting. Thank you all very much for coming today and have a great day. Thanks everybody.